the market's more fully valued here, right? And I'm not saying it's a it's a short, but it, the Bears are, are, you know, they got their head between their knees. I mean, it's just, it's so, we talked to one today, it just, I felt, felt feel bad for them. I think that there will be another shot of, if you're so inclined to short the market when the market calls its bluff, right? When, when, when you finally have to go through some sort of austerity. On the Tape is presented by CME Group, where risk meets opportunity, and iConnections, reimagining how the investment industry connects. Welcome back to another edition of what are we doing? Never has it been more relevant than right now. I want to welcome back Porter Collins and Vincent Daniel. And I want to just let people know the last time they were on in this venue was Thanksgiving. We did a special drop. A lot was going on then in the markets. And then we were all together um, down to the iConnections conference in Miami at the end of January. We were on a panel with our former partner, Steve Eisman, um, hosted by Melissa Lee. And then we were on Fast Money. So it was great to get together. So we've been sharing some thoughts out there with the public, but it feels like right now, we're certainly always feels like we're at that point. Feels though right now more relevant than ever. So well, I'd love to start out by just getting your guys kind of current thoughts on the macro. And then we're certainly going to dive into some single names as we go on. So uh, Porter, we'll start with you here. Give me your, your thoughts here. Well, you know, everyone thinks of us as three bears and, you know, we've been big short guys and stuff like that. But the one short that we've been continuously pounding is Tesla. And Tesla is, I believe, rough math, 10% below the October lows, whereas the S&P is up 23% from the October lows. So, you know, I'm not victory lapping or anything, but, you know, the, the we've been right to be bearish on a certain car company. So... So how does that fit into your narrative on the macro? Is it that the macro is be starting to become or is becoming more stock picking by the day? You know, we're starting to see what was the Magnificent Seven is now whatever we're calling it, the Fab or Fantastic Four. At some point, you know, just got to ignore those four and go invest and buy and sell stocks that are the other 496. So within that macro context, what are the drivers that you guys are looking at? I actually think it has nothing to do with the macro, with with respect to Tesla, because if you think about it, we've had a tremendous easing of financial conditions. So you would think a name like Tesla would be up significantly more or up in general rather than being down. I think it's an acknowledgement of the market, which is a good thing, um, at least from market participants, that that fundamentals do matter. And as a result, what why is Tesla down? Well, Tesla is down because the earnings expectations of this company uh, have come down by a tremendous amount. And so as a result, I think people have choices to what they want to do with their money, particularly when they think about mega cap companies to overweight or underweight, let alone go long or go short. And as a result, Tesla is the one they're choosing not to buy or choosing to underweight or quite frankly, sell. So, so that makes a lot of sense. I don't think that has to do with a, a macro top down thing. I think it's more of a single stock. Well, I just want to say, let me interject there because I, I, just, I the, the macro viewpoint on that, in my mind, would be that people want comfort that earnings are going up, that they're buying something that has momentum fundamentally. That is a macro theme, and we're seeing it expressed in AI, and we're seeing it expressed in GLP drugs. Right, we're we're, we're seeing that. So I would push back a little bit. So I, I think it starts with some overall expectation that I can feel comfortable owning, and it feels like. Those are starting to get more and more concentrated. But I hear you in terms of the bottom-up work is everything that matters to the three of us, first and foremost. But I guess we've all gotten burnt or all had to respect the macro in terms of how people are all moving in the same direction on certain things and understand that sometimes it takes a lot for people to come off that. But when it does come off, as you just mentioned with Tesla, you can see it in spades. And so I, I would just add that, Porter. Yeah, listen, the, the, there are... There are corners of this market that are you know extremely speculative obviously the crypto being one of them you know that the, the I, I would say that the you know we i think all three of us have always liked the bitcoin angle i think the uh crypto angle is you know when you get into you know uh pp coin and and come rocket and all these other stupid names yes there's a lot of shenanigans over we, we were going through there's a uh, hundred altcoins over a billion dollars in market cap like it, it it just gets bananas we were trying to go through heck what what's the market cap or what's the uh total market cap of tops cards you know not not very high so if you if you 
just pure financial speculation, yes, there's a lot of that going on, right? And some of that's driven by NVIDIA, but NVIDIA, to be fair, you know, it's been driven by earnings. It's, you know, we can forget about the, we can debate about forward expectations, but the earnings have been unbelievably impressive. You know, the other one that's, you know, stock that's been weak is Apple. Apple's only a couple percent off its October lows. And, you know, I, I can't help but think about Tesla and Apple together is that, you know, they are very Chinese centric uh, stocks. You know, that Apple's lost a lot of market share in uh, China to Huawei. And Tesla's obviously gotten demolished in, in China to, you know, by the BYD and others. So, you know, I, it, it, yes, there are pockets of, of speculation, but otherwise, you know, I, I dare say some, some pockets are acting very rationally. Let me try again to bring this back to the macro, just kind of start the process. I know, I mean, I had Tesla kind of on my list of things at the bottom, but somehow it always works its way to the top. I appreciate that. But we're in this moment right now that where people are, you know, looking to the Fed and we're going to, we're a day ahead here as we, as we kind of record this Tuesday evening, we're ahead of the Humphrey Hawkins testimony that Powell will be in front and people will take whatever they want from it. Um, and over the last week or so, Fed's gone out of its way to be a bit more hawkish. But what's really interesting on a day like today, just when the stock market goes down, you're watching 4%, 6% changes in increased expectations of a Fed cut just from what the market does. But let me just back that up just, just a bit here. So this is the problem that I'm having right now I want you guys to reconcile. I know that people are ignoring the federal debt, okay? Most people are ignoring it, okay? And they don't understand the plumbing. They don't need to understand the plumbing. They don't want to understand the plumbing. And I think about it as a, a sink that's running and water's flowing and there's liquidity and all of a sudden, and no one cares to go to Investopedia until the sink gets backed up, right? So here's my problem. If the Fed's going to come to the rescue, and they will at some point to provide liquidity, what causes that to happen is a slowdown in the economy, I think you would agree, which is a slowdown in GDP, which to me highlights the debt to GDP issue that we are going to have. Again, maybe I'm, maybe I'm overthinking it, okay? But at some point, we've seen this, this term premium that people are going to want and need it in the fall. And Yellen trying to do her thing about, oh, we're going to do less tenor on the longer end. We're going to do you know, more on the shorter end, all this crap. But it goes back to what people that like Luke Groman has talked about, this kind of fiscal dominance. And, we're, and so long-winded way, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys for your thoughts here. When you see Bitcoin and gold, and we'll talk about gold. We've been bulls on that for a while. Start to move like this with stocks and everything happening at one time. I'm sorry. And that's great because everyone's making money. That's an uneasy feeling when all those things are working at the same time. So something's going on. And I want to get your thoughts on that because, again, it's going to be an Investopedia moment here soon. And people need to know what they're going to search for. Okay. So why don't we push back on you here? So people, you said people are ignoring the debt. And I think, you know, as much I don't like, I don't love crypto bros, but the Bitcoin guys would argue that Bitcoin's not ignoring the, uh, the, the, the debt levels. Gold up, you know, what's off the Oct October low. I think it's up, you know, 16% off the October low. So almost doing as well as the S&P, which is unfathomable, right? And oil up off the bottom. So I, I think there's a lot of things out there that aren't ignoring the, the other side, right? Of, of but treasury the yields, long-term treasury yields are not, yields are not exploding higher. And that to me would be a signal that people are paying attention to the debt load. Unless well, I'm not that's, thinking about that's, it. That's one of the signals that is not fully yet, but there are other signals that are showing that to me, when I look at gold and Bitcoin, I say to myself, okay, clearly that what they're telling me, I think, is that the Fed might now be behind the curve in terms of what they need to do. And what I mean by that is, while they have come off three, four, five, six rate cuts, I mean, just yesterday, I think it was Bostic that still said, well, we're going to do a cut in 3Q, or at least that was what uh, the financial media told me that he said. And my view is like, wow, I have rising nominal GDP relative to expectations. I have rising inflation relative to expectations. There's no reason, based upon those things, there's no reason they should be talking about a Fed rate cut at all, yet they are still talking about a cut of some nature or kind this year. I think Bitcoin and gold are just saying, I got you. 
Now, Bitcoin's quite idiosyncratic, right? We just got shoved, or God knows why they did it, but they did a bunch of ETFs on the same day that allowed people who wanted to express an interest in Bitcoin can now do so. So as a result, I get Bitcoin's massive move up, but gold is following suit. So to me, they're just simply saying, I feel like the Fed's a bit behind the curve. And to top it off what you were saying, the reason why we have some such great economic growth is because we're running six to 8% fiscal deficits. That, and so I just think it's sniffing it out. Sniffing it out in the sense of that they're going to lose control because you're making an argument that, so gold has not worked on inflation basically during this entire cycle. It worked on supply and demand. It worked on central banks hoarding it. It worked on a lot. But to me, if Bitcoin's going up with gold, it's what you're kind of, I think, talking about, which is at some point, the, either the Fed becomes irrelevant because, you know, yeah, cuts may come and so forth, but maybe the picture, maybe there's a bigger picture here, I guess, is what I'm saying. And I go back to that comment about kind of fiscal stimulus that's kind of been in front of us continuously that I think I've ignored the impact that that's had on the stock market, right? The trillions of dollars that have come in and the debt's been rising. And I said it was, it was 10 months ago, and I should have harped on it more, that when the debt ceiling was, was uncapped through January 2025, I mentioned it, I said, I wonder if this is something that I should really be paying attention to. Is this a seminal shift, which happened six weeks after Silicon Valley and the BTFP came in with 500 billion. So we basically threw 500 billion plus what will probably end up being from that moment until January 2025, I don't know, three and a half to four and a half trillion dollars worth of more debt coming to the system. So shame on me because I really believe at the end of the day, it's all about liquidity. Vinny, what's up? Welcome to the club, Danny. <laughs> and once you come into this club, yeah. right, it's a scary place. Yes. You're right. Most of the people do not pay attention to what you just said, right? And I remember, oh, got six, nine months ago, and I was yelling at Guy, and I said to Guy, Guy, stop yelling at the Federal Reserve. Start yelling at the politicians and the fiscal imbalances that, are, that have been being created and are getting worse and, and accelerating. I think, sadly, it's going to continue. I think we said it's the last time we were on. There's an election to win, right? And he's not going to stop spending money. The last thing I expect out of him, out of the State of the Union address that's coming uh, 7th, he might pay some lit service to balancing the budget. But, the, but what really is going to be discussed is every single pork initiative that he's going to have, and he's going to plow the money as a result of it. So we're going to continue to see fiscal deficits. It's, the real question is, do we start to see that rates sniff this out? And if they do, then we got a real problem. I give Danny full credit because we used to call Danny a beautiful mind. He's the only one that pointed out that they kicked the can until 2025, Danny, the, the, the debt ceiling. And, you know, the debt has exploded since then. Absolutely exploded. And so, you know, I, I think that, you know, in some pockets, this market's acting very rationally, that, that they're just inflating away this bubble, or they're trying to inflate away this bubble. And so... Uh, yeah. So I, I think you need to. You could take it bearishly or bullishly, and and you know I I think that facts are facts, right? You pointed out the facts, and I and I want to bring it back to the one sector that we've all spent the most time of our careers on, which is the banking sector, which is a, plays a pivotal role, obviously, in all of this. And if you go back to kind of the throes of March of last year and the Silicon Valley crisis, Signature Bank, et cetera. Um, and what's happened since then, the big banks have obviously found some strong footing. I think it's a combination, um, I think, of, of lease rates being somewhat contained, M&A coming back a little bit, um, the IPO, IPO market coming back a little bit, although it's not as strong as I would have thought right now. And you're seeing a name like J.P. Morgan, which, again, I think the three of us agree would never be short something like that, making new highs here and up 50 percent from that moment. So with the NYCB situation real in front of us, and people are just kind of, I guess, at this point, immune to it or believe it doesn't matter. It'll be fine because the Fed and Treasury are going to clean it up. Is this a situation where the big banks combination of regulatory easing, maybe given what we're seeing in the kind of pre-election numbers that we're seeing going to happen in, you know, at, at, towards the end of the year? And then also, um, just in general, these big banks are going to be the ones that are going to be, again, another round potentially of M&A where they're going to gobble up some of these smaller banks. So give me guys, the, give me your thoughts on kind of the banking sector. And are you guys active in it at all at the moment? 
Well, a couple of things. I mean, everyone talks about J.B. Morgan. The tr- chart looks fabulous, but uh, you know, while while Tesla's down ten percent from the October lows, uh, good old Key Corp, one of the worst regional banks. Sorry, Key Corp. Uh, in, in the history of of, of uh, regional banks, is up fifty percent from the October lows, right? And so, yes, you do have NYB, NYCB, right? And I, I th- kind of think that it's a yes, the market's sort of right, and it's a little bit isolated. And the, yes, they do have bad credit, but at the end of the day, look what happened to Silly Valley, uh, FRC, and and the others. You know, it was a problem when the depositors pulled their money. People forget that NYCB was having issues again prior to these acquisitions that they made, um, just from the rent caps that were going on within New York City. So these are things that were going to come to light. But it feels like I'm not I'm not shorted. I don't think you guys are either unless, you know, I don't think you are um, that I don't think you can survive here because I think that it's in a situation I could be wrong. But its impact on markets is interesting, Danny, right? I think all of us would be a lot more nervous and have trepidation if we didn't see what the Fed and regulators did last March with Silicon Valley, First Republic, Signature Bank, and the like. Let's rewind the clock. And in Sil- at, at Silly Valley, there were a tremendous amount of uninsured deposits, depositors that were potentially on the hook. And as Porter likes to say, he's right. This was one of the worst crises that was solved in 48 hours by waving the magic wand and insuring all those deposits. People just naturally assume, and rightfully so, that they're going to go out and save the depositors again, whatever happens. So no one's really materi- seriously nervous about the systemic implications of New York Community Bank. And I think that New York Community does have a lot of uh, insured deposits, and I would, I would have to think that a lot of the uninsured deposits have already left the bank. And so, you know, when this thing, when they hand over the keys to either the FDIC or to, you know... Uh, you know, the, the, the house of JP Morgan next week, or it's, you know, it, it's not a huge issue. So yes. or, or it survives or it survives or it survives. Yeah. It might. Is there something more to the banks right now, as far as maybe a safe rotation, people feel that in the big banks, they need exposure to the financials, but you just mentioned key corp. You're right. Which is obviously up 50%, kind of these high beta names that had big short interest in them are obviously rallying now, but is there anything more to, to look let's at in these our, things? And- Danny, let's not kid ourselves. The economy is doing like nominal GDP is ripping. No, I, I totally understand that. But we're at book values. We're not expensive by any means. But we've gone from, I'm going to guess, that, I'm going to make this up. To get, I'm guessing the low in book value on key at one point because they were thrown into the mix last year was probably 0. 0.6 or 0. 0.7. I'm going to make that up. That's probably trading at what, one point, it's only 1.2, 1.3 times book here, something like that. Is that? The the best and uh, well and well run uh, bank yeah, in the world, M and T Bank, it trades at its cheapest valuation it it's been in you know thirty years, and you know yeah they have do they have bad commercial real estate loans probably but you know they're way ahead of the situation they've reserved for it, and uh, you know nominal GDP is ripping assets around the world are inflating. And so maybe some of these assets are, end up being fine and skate through. And so I, that's, I think, one of the reasons that uh, for now, the banks have done okay. A few things on this. Let's talk about the word job security. You ready? Uh, if you want to invest in financials and you're a long-only investor and you want to hug the index, you can hug the XLF, okay? I'm going to give you the top components of the XLF, not the KRE. All right. Number one, Warren Buffet. Warren Buffet at 13.2%. Number two, JD, Jamie Dimon at 9.7%. Number three, Visa at 8.0%. Number four, MasterCard. I love how Visa is in the financial, the MasterCard are in this magnificent. At 7%. Then you get the first Bank America, but still a large bank. S&P Global, I think that's SPG, at 2.5%. And then American Express, then BlackRock. My point is, you don't really have to touch a bank to own the financials and hug the index. And so as a result, I think that's the reason why, Danny, you're seeing the large caps significantly outpour, outperform the mid caps in the regional banks. All right. So I want to move into another sector here. Um, obviously, near and dear, your heart's what you guys have been spending the, kind of, the, I think, the most constructive time on in the last several years is energy. 
and you're seeing a rotation right in front of us right now. And, you know, certainly NVIDIA can stay up and all this stuff can happen, but it feels like we're at the precipice of money rotating into the sector um, for the first time in a long time. And I'd love to get your thoughts on that. And then within that, I know there's certain names you like. Uh, Petrobras just obviously reported earnings recently. Get your thoughts there, since I know that's been a name you guys have talked on several occasions. Well, let's first start with the, the M&A. Like we've seen a lot of M&A in, in, um, in uh, oil and gas, right? Fang did, did uh, you know, M&A recently and stock's done great. Uh, you know, there have been a couple uh, mid-cap M&A deals that, that look like they're reasonably priced. Uh, you know, and they're, they're, none of these guys are really growing CapEx. So they've really said all the right things. Stocks have been, I, I guess, okay. We, we haven't been super, well, we have a small fang along. But other than that, conventional U.S. names, we don't have a lot of exposure. Um, you know, Petrobras has done done well um, still. And then I guess the other energy stuff that we, we've been in coal, and that's been, I would say, this past year's fine. You know, it's it's been slow and steady, except for AMR, which has been an absolute champ. So that's that's kind of where we are. These names are not expensive. You know, the the deals are are look well priced, and so um, the 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 one bear point to energy names is obviously nat gas, and and we've had a series of warm winters, and nat gas is struggling to get over two bucks, and so think you know if you saw four dollar nat gas or three dollar nat gas i think you could easily get much more excited about uh these energy names but right now you know people there's there's a lot for good reason we're, we're swimming in natural gas at this point so i find the sector interesting because it's 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 a great place where you could differentiate and and do a lot of single stock analysis so for example uh with nat- natty gas uh there's been uh, a reduction of rig counts uh, particularly domestically. So you want to try to avoid anything, as Porter said, that we're not really involved in some of the domestic EMP names. Uh, conversely, a lot of the offshore, particularly the offshore service providers, we have been involved in uh, names like Tidewater and Belarus. So we, so I find the, the sector fascinating because there are different ways you can go based upon the fundamentals that you see. And the fundamentals are usually based upon supply demand all over the place, which makes life a little bit easier for fundamental analysts like ourselves. And Danny, as you can see, we, you know, like we, when you were with us, you know, we, we heat seek towards improving fundamentals, right? Where we, we sort of try to heat seek to where we can find reasonable valuations and some sort of inflection in earnings or continuous growth trend in earnings that the market hasn't quite figured out. And so that's where we spend uh, most of our time, whether it's energy or, you know, pockets in financials or pockets in shipping or even tech, you know, we, 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 you know, we, we traffic all over the place, but we, we try to find reasonable valuations and, and some definitely improving fundamentals. Well, the reason I, you know, started this, um, interview with the macro is that the two sectors that depends the most on the macro are financials and energy and the macro inputs of interest rates are key to figure out what a bank's earnings potential are to a degree. And the price of energy is key to figure out whether it's gas or oil, what it might be. And so that's why I mentioned it, because you can be the smartest analyst bottom up, right? And if you don't know or have comfort with those inputs, but it feels like within energy that we're at a point, to your point you made before, the balance sheets are so clean that, yes, of course, if oil goes to $40, these stocks are going lower. Let's not, let's not kid ourselves. They're going to go lower. But I feel like the level of kind of self-improvement that these energy companies still have the ability to do. When I say that, I mean, instead of drilling or <laughs> doing anything with all they can buy back stock, like they're doing, make cash acquisitions, whatever. So talk to me a little bit about that, because the, you're kind of your guys thought process when you think about the macro and kind of the bounds that you put on it, both, for, I think, for banks and interest rate curves and also kind of oil and natural gas. Well, it's actually interesting you bring up this topic. And, and one of the things that I think drive all of us insane is the amount of financial shenanigans out there, right? And what do I mean in this context? Well, if you look at the companies that we're generally involved with, they're, you know, good balance sheets, use excess cash prudently, buy back stock, give a dividend. Then you take on the other side, you look at 
SMCI, right? A, a, a sort of a, I don't even know what they do, a, a shenanigans company. As soon as the stock goes up, they're, they're printing with, with two converts in your face, right? Or MicroStrategy. You know, every moment of the day, they're selling stock to you, right? And so I think you have this dichotomy out there of prudent, good companies, you know, you know, have to do everything perfectly just to get the stock up. And then a huge, you know, speculation bubble over here where they're constantly selling stock to you. You sense. bring up a great point, And I know Vinny wants to hit this because we missed it last time. And that's another macro input. And that's Bitcoin. And when you look at names like MicroStrategy and Coinbase and you try to match up those, quote, things, right, as Vinny's putting his head down, whatever. Talk to me about that arbitrage, Ben, in terms of what's happening there right now. Yeah. Well, you talked about a a Vince and Daniel casualty. Um, So, you know, like many, we saw uh, what was happening with Bitcoin, with the proliferation of ETFs. And I actually view Bitcoin in a similar manner, not not as religious as I am on gold, but in a similar manner to gold. It is a way to express your distaste for what's happening with fiscal and monetary policy, combined with the fact that you had a near-term ca- catalyst. I had no problems owning Bitcoin. But the other side of the coin I thought was equally compelling, right? Which is, oh Lord, now that there are new ways to express this, it's actually going to change the business. Micro strategies, if you simply just take the balance sheet and look at how much Bitcoin they own and give some valuation to their software business, it trades between a 50 to 100% premium to, to spot value of Bitcoin. Wouldn't it be great if I could just simply buy Bitcoin, which we did, and short micro strategies, which we also did? So we would have a nice, beautiful pair that should collapse and make a pretty decent spread. I think. Our former employer, Ken Griffin, would be proud of us on on this trade. However, it worked for about three weeks. And then Porter gave me the kiss of death and said, Vinny, I am so proud of you. This is a great pair. Ken Griffin would be proud of you. And from that day, it has sucked, right? And, and, And so you ask yourself the question, Danny, why is that? I think it's a function of liquidity, market structure, algos. There's no reason why anyone should be buying, at least I haven't heard of a great theory of why someone should be buying micro strategy relative to saying buying spot Bitcoin. In fact, I think they're brilliantly issuing converts because they have a price narrative arb. Sorry, you got me on a rant now. A price narrative arb where I, they could issue dollar, they could purchase money with dollars, buy Bitcoin, and the market automatically gives them a two times valuation on the stuff that they purchase. That's insanity. But it is, it is what it is. It's what's happening. We kept the pair on. It hasn't been that painful because we've been, we've been uh, on both sides. But you're right, Danny. I, I don't get some of the valuations. But the only way I could sort of justify it in my head is that there are machines out there that are going to do things that I prefer them not doing, but it is what it is. All right. So before we get out of here, um, there is another gripe that I know you have. And that's with Guy Adami's hatred for the New York Mets. It's, it's almost unnatural. And we've talked about it before. So we're in spring training now. I'm sure, unfortunately, you and I both know, three of us know that there'll be some injuries that will happen in spring training. Just could even just be going out to dinner with some of these players. The Mets seem to have that. But give me your thoughts on the Mets going into the season. And then uh, obviously there's going to be some bets uh, with you guys and Guy in terms of the performance versus the Yankees. Uh, he would have to give me odds and 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 a bunch of wins. Uh, I for me, the over under for the Mets for me is eighty one games. And the best thing I could say about the Mets this year is that the expectations are so low that no one's going to care. And the way I think about it was, I think Steve Cohen was the, on a dual track process, which is one to provo- put a product on the field. That looks good. That would that would satisfy people like myself to go to the stadium, but more important, work on building the farm system so that three to four years from now, our farm system would look like the Dodgers, the Yankees, your Braves, which are really the symbol of greatness as a farm system. Unfortunately, the trade didn't work in terms of Verlander, Scherzer, and the like. And like a great trader, Steve Cohen basically assessed the trade, said it's not working, and decayed it. And so now we're back. So basically, the Mets are the uh, gold miners of uh, 
baseball. But with the wealth potential, water. but never realizing anything. Yeah. Hey, Vinny, did the you know the line? It. Vinny, did you know the over under before you said that? Close. Yeah. You knew it. It's eighty one and a half. It was eighty three. It keeps dropping. Yeah. And then Senga Senga got injured, so they dropped it to eighty one. Like I said, gold exactly. miners. Yeah, gold miners. All right, Mets are gold miners. I can do that. Maybe. By the way, you could tell that's a guy, even though he loves gold, he would still hate them. But we'll he's not. A, he's not a big better. But I bet me and him could go out to dinner, Paisan style. But he has to give me, you know, odds on over under Yankees on a spread, and I'll definitely do it. So tell him. And you guys do your Thursday thing. Let's let's try and broker a yeah, deal. Let me, deal that. let me just preview what's coming up on Thursday for the Friday drop of on the tape, and that is um, Guy and Dan are talking to our good friend Melissa Lee. And she just had that documentary, The Big Shot, which actually was really good. And then Brian Beltsky, um, the chief investment strategist over at BMO. I will not be a part of those conversations because I get to do this with you guys today. But that will undoubtedly be a great episode that will drop, drop on Friday morning. And I think we're going to be in a period of time. And I know we've started this a little bit more, but maybe more than once every two months. Maybe we do it a couple times a month. I know we've said that before, but I feel like we're going to have a lot to talk about, guys. And um, Hey, Danny, can I, can, I turn, can I turn it around on you right now? Go ahead. I, I want to – what are you thinking? What, what, what's, your single, what's your single favorite idea right here? What's, what's going on? How are you feeling? I'm feeling pretty good. I mean, I'm – listen, you know, I love the sports gambling stocks. I've been on them for a while. I like secular plays that I don't think are too expensive. I love gold. I hate Tesla. I don't like to talk about it. I just, I own TSLQ and I, I've literally put it away as if it's my long Walmart stock, which I'm long as well. And I'm just going to wait. I mean, I don't, I think there's going to be opportunities in this market, massive dislocations. And to be honest, I'm more excited about getting long things when there finally is some type of reckoning, so to speak, than being short, than finding shorts right now. So I think that the, to your guys' point, the economy is fine right now. Um, I don't know how long that's going to last. I do believe that the fiscal stimulus has just done a number in terms of trying to figure out what is the true economic cycle here. And that's just hard to gauge. But unfortunately, um, for our children and the next generations, I, I just don't see how this debt situation doesn't present itself in just a very difficult environment for a long period of time, what we've done to ourselves here. And so behind all of that, I guess, Porter, what I'm saying is with that backdrop way behind, I can't get away from that. I know that will always hurt me short term, but I have to be intellectually honest with myself when I'm looking at the markets. Danny, the way the way we've I've sort of wrestled with it and settled with it is that and people get very mad when you bring it up and 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 the like at the very least it forces them to conduct policy to deal with this debt for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So that's where our mindset is. And so they're not good. They can't go austerity. No one's even talking about it or thinking about it. And most people in DC and Wall Street are ignoring it. That being said, the people, the, the string pullers, the people who are controlling things, and I think about Janet Yellen in particular, she knows it's a problem. Powell knows it's a problem. And so, so many of the things that you, when you, when you get it in your head that this is a problem, so many of the things you see that they do come back to this issue, right? Whether we like it or not, like whether, Moving from coupon, issuing coupons to bills is a function of this debt, is a function of the inability to pay interest expense of magnitudes and extend the duration of your debt structure. So just keep that in mind when you're, when you're seeing this. It actually opens your eyes to some of the decisions they, they make. And by the way, they, you know, we, we, we obviously talk to a lot of bears and the bears are, are, you know, they got their head between their knees. I mean, it's just, it's so, we talked to one today. It just, I felt feel bad for him, you know, and so I think that there will be another shot of, if you're so inclined to short the market. You know, the, the there will be a shot when when the when the market calls its bluff, right? When 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 you finally have to go through some sort of austerity or or something like that, or maybe the inflation gets out of control and the Fed's God God willing forced to hike. Right. And so I think those are the, you know, the market's more fully valued here. Right. And I'm not saying it's a, it's a short, but it, you know, it's, it's fair, or fully valued on, on, um, on just like the, the, mar the markets are almost as expensive as it's ever been. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I guess, I you know, I'll, I'll say this again, and we've talked about this before. 
in the three of us or four of us saw it, you know, when you see kind of the end of the world um, in terms of the, the end of the financial world up close, um, it's hard to unsee it. And it's also unnatural what's happened um, in the last 15, 16 years as far as the intervention. And to Vinny's point, you know, whether they're, you know, they take that heroin away or there's austerity measures that start to occur, it's easily said, it's not easily done. And the amount of pain that would have to happen for that, and it may just be drawn out over 30 or 40 years period of time, I get it. But that to me, this normalization, and maybe it doesn't happen for a long time, it's hard to think past that. And we are in this commercial real estate situation right now, which is a slow moving, I get it, slow moving train. But rest assured, there will be a front and center CRE situation again that we're not thinking about that's in some pocket somewhere that's probably levered that's going to shake up. It just will. It'll happen. It's just not, there's just no way it's going to be this smooth. And again, I'm not saying to go short certain things that are out there, but that is a major drag uh, on as far as I'm concerned. It was a, such a big driver of growth even prior to the financial crisis. But, and maybe start, people start going back to the office more, I get it, and maybe it can be fixed. But it, to me, it's something else that's being ignored. So, you know, <laughs> go down that rabbit hole, um, but you try to be constructive and take advantage of market dislocations. And, and that's really all, you know, all we can do is be opportunistic. It's debt-fueled growth. That's what we've been on, right? We've been on a binge of debt-fueled growth and, you know, uh, margin loans, a lot of speculation. Uh, so, yeah, you're, we, you know, I think you're right to be skeptical here. All right, guys, on that note, uh, you flipped the table on me. Uh, I like we'll have the table nice, on you, Danny. That was nice. We'll have you. That was a very like CNBC Melissa Lee thing to do to me. Uh, you know, surprise <laughs> me. Too. Um, but we'll have you guys back on, obviously, uh, hopefully soon. And keep up the great work, Seawolf. And thanks for coming on, boys. All right. Great thanks stuff. for having us.